Somebody said it's hard to live life as a Christian without the Holy Spirit. And I even um, at one point thought of it like this. You know, I, I'm a Christian and um, without the Holy Spirit, I have like a shovel and I'm digging a six foot hole. Right. And that would be hard, especially in the weather we've been getting. But if I had to dig a six by six foot hole, OK, um, with a shovel, it would take me a while, but I could get it done. Right. Is that right? Anybody ever dug a hole with a shovel? You can get it done. Well, back in the day, Mr. Uh, Hefner up here is the only one who raised his hand because he's the only one. Everybody else got some kind of machine. But anyway, <laughs> y'all can kind of imagine it would be hard, right? Yeah. But imagine if I had a backhoe. My daddy was a backhoe driver. And he would take that thing and a zoop, zoop, couple of minutes, he's all done, not even sweating. And today there are cabs with air conditioning, so you... You really don't have to worry about that. So I would describe it like this. As a believer, without the Holy Spirit, it's just like me taking a shovel and digging a hole. I can get it done, but it's going to be hard. It's going to take a long time. But with the Holy Spirit, I'm like a backhoe driver. No problem. Got her done. But the more I recognize from the word of God that it's impossible, it's impossible to live this life as a believer without the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because he's the one that causes it in the beginning. He's the one that imparts the life of God to us. He's the one who causes us to be born again. Amen? It's through our faith in Jesus, but the Holy Spirit comes in and does the work and causes us to be a new creation. So we are God in America. Amen? And if you want to see something change in America, go look in the mirror and say, let's get her done. Amen? Amen? All right. If you're using a paper Bible, lift it up with me today. If you're not and you're going to be using your phone, lift that up. Hey, Mom. And declare with me, this is the word of God. I believe it to be truth. Whatever I hear from the word of God today. I will allow it to be planted on the good ground of my heart that it may bring forth much fruit for the glory and the honor of the Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give the Lord some praise as you sit down. Come on, celebrate the good, good Father that we have. Amen. Amen. Okay, and if I'm too loud, somebody raise your hand because I'm just going to get louder. Okay, so, <laughs> all right, so help them out back there. We're going to talk about the spirit of truth. And I know right now, and I asked Pastor Bobby to help me with this, and I've sat in his office for hours, and he has shared so much with me, even sent some articles and some things I could read. And I tell you, it's deep, because y'all know Pastor Bobby's deep. So I'm just going to give you the short Liz, bobble version of this little short part that I just want to lay out in the beginning. Right now, there's something going on in the world that says your truth and my truth don't have to be the same, but they can still be true. That if I believe it to be so, or I imagine it to be so, or I feel it to be so, then that's my truth. And if you have a totally different view on it, it's okay because that can be your truth. And we all can be true because we want to be true to ourselves. Amen? That's what's going around in the world. But how many of you know that the Bible says God is, let God be true. It says let God be true and every man a liar. As a matter of fact, in the book of Romans, Chapter, yeah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Thank you, April. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? <laughs> God forbid. Yea, let God be true, 
but every man a liar. It is written that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou judge thou art judged. Now let's look at that in the Amplified. The Amplified version puts it this way and it makes it a little bit easier for us to understand. What's the advantage of the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God, his very words. What then, if some did not believe or were unfaithful to God, their lack of belief will not nullify and make invalid the faithfulness of God, amen, and his word. Will it? Certainly not. Let God be true as he will be, though every person be found a liar, just as it is written in scripture, that it may be justified in your words. In other words, God is saying, look, I don't care what people stamp as truth today. I am truth. I have always been truth, and I will always be truth. Amen? Amen? Yeah. So we're going to talk about the spirit of truth, and we're going to kind of go get to it from around the corner and up the road a bit. I have in front of me an apple and an orange, and guys, I am echoing so bad, I don't know if I can. I have an apple, uh oh, I have an orange <laughs> and an apple. Oh, I almost messed up my examples there. Okay, and let's just say I believe that this is an apple. Now, over here, guys, this is what? It's a who? More enthusiasm. Apple. There you go. This is an apple. And over here on this side of the room, ladies and gentlemen, what is this? Orange. It is an orange. And it seems like we have a consensus. Everybody 100% orange, right? Everybody here 100%? No. Right? But what if I decide, me, one person, out of the room of, I don't know, 200, 300 people, I decide that this is no longer to me an apple. This is now. An orange. Come on, come on, this is an orange. This is an orange. This is an orange. Ah, an orange. And I put on Facebook to all my friends, all 15 of them, to <laughs> that uh, now y'all are all gonna say, oh, let's help her out. Let's go be her friend. <laughs> I put them on there. Guys, I have a new belief. I believe that this is an orange. And I make a club. And I invite people to learn more about the new truth of this as an orange. And I get three people in my club. And we go on a cruise together. And we paste all our pictures about how much fun we're having on our cruise. And on our shirts, we have a big red, this thing, and on the front, it says, this is orange. All right. All right. And every time we see one of these things, we bust it with a bat. This is orange. How many of you would think I had just kind of flipped out a little bit? Even right now, y'all are starting to wonder, does she really believe? Is she okay? But what have we allowed society to say to us? You guys are saying, that's so stupid. This has always been an apple. It will always be an apple. Even when I go to France or Germany, they may say another word, but when it is translated into English, it's going to be apple. But we have allowed, I won't say we, because all of us haven't allowed, some people in our world, in our nation, has decided that it is okay to take something that always had been, that was created to be one thing, and because they have a whim or a feeling or a desire or it works out better for them for the moment, 
I'm just going to change it. Stupid, huh? Then why are we buying into the lie? Let God be true. And we're worrying about, I mean, you, you really probably wouldn't worry about offending me. You would put on my Facebook, Liz, you got to be joking. That's an apple girl. Quit tripping. And I, if I persisted, you may even come by my house and say, girl, I just want to have lunch with you. Because um, I saw something on your Facebook that disturbed me a little bit. And you seem so serious. At first I thought you were joking, but... It's, I mean, it's been going on for weeks now. <laughs> Certainly, you really don't think that's an orange. You wouldn't really, if you were my friend, you really wouldn't be concerned about offending me because it's so far out. You got to think, Liz, no, really. And things have gotten so far out and we're so concerned about offending that we will walk away from something that's obviously true and buy into the lie. Because after a while, if they show it on TV enough, if they subliminally put it in your favorite shows on your favorite game show, so what it does is it just be begins to desensitize us. So we're not so sensitive to sin. And I think we should begin to pray, God, those things that you love, help me to embrace. Those things that you hate, help me to hate. It's such a strong word, Liz. Wait, are we to really hate? God has a list of things that he says he hates. And I think I want to be on the wagon with Jesus and hate those things that God hates and don't become desensitized to it so I can find myself buying in and perhaps miss out on an opportunity to show love. I didn't say hate somebody. I said to hate the sin so that we can love properly the people. Amen? Amen. All right, let me hear if and find another scripture, because I got a couple of little eyes hitting me on the side over here. <laughs> no. All right, so here we go. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. And I wrote in my notes here that um, you can say, well, Liz, that's silly, that's just fruit. But it was just fruit that got Adam and Eve into a whole lot of trouble. John, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. We're talking about the spirit of truth, but in order to actually, for me, to lay it out really good, I got to talk about got the Father and got the Son as well because they are one. And in 1 John 5 and 7 it says the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost and these three are one. So when we look at God the Father, we see that God the Father um, is truth and we'll walk through some verses of Scripture. We're going to kind of go fast because I got a lot of verses of Scripture and I want to kind of at least let you hear a lot, the majority of them. Certainly not, not. Let God be found true, that's Romans 3, 4, as he will be. And I love that the way the Amplified said that, as he will be, because God doesn't change. So if God is truth today, his truth today is going to be truth tomorrow. And that's why the word of God never becomes irrelevant. It's never outdated. Okay. That's why the word of God is never... is. <laughs> It's always relevant. It's never outdated, right? And even though it was written um, thousands of years ago, it is still true and valid today. 
whether it is on my phone, on my iPad, on my computer, in paperback, on my, on my watch, whatever, it's still true today. Look at your neighbor and say, the word of God is still true today. Look at another neighbor and say, I said, the word of God is still true today. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it is, it is impossible, say impossible, impossible for God to lie, that we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. In other words, we, you don't have to lose hope because if God said it, it is so today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen? Titus 1-2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Amen. Say it again. Say, uh, say it with me. God cannot lie. God cannot lie. Exodus 34, 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Hallelujah. Psalm 31, verse 5. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O God of truth. God is true. His word is true. He hasn't changed. He will always be the truth. You can depend on that. So if God spoke something to you, if God said something to you, if you see something in the word of God, even though David may have been the hand or the pen that the Holy Spirit used to write it down, it is still true and valid for you today. So as Brother Jimmy was up here talking about uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You can imagine David out in the field with his sheep smelling like one of them, and he's out there thinking about all that is going on. He pins this, and then years later, he faces Goliath. But the Lord was still his shepherd. The Lord was still his, he was, it was his shepherd when he faced the bear and the lion that he took out. Amen? And God was still his shepherd when he faced the giant. God was still his shepherd when he faced Saul, when Saul, the king of Israel, was trying to kill him. Thousands of his kinsmen were looking for him to murder him. The Lord was still David's shepherd. Do you see what I'm saying? So if it was good for David when he was 16 and 17 and 18 and 30, and when he took on the Philistines, and there was one scripture that um, in the book of 2 Samuel 9, I believe, where it said that David had defeated all his enemies. He was king at the time, been king for almost a decade. And he had defeated all his enemies. He was still doing it under the understanding of God's my shepherd. And so no matter where we are in life, whether we've lost our favorite toy or we can't find our phone or a loved one has died or we need a car or our bill is way past due or we're looking for God to work an absolute miracle because the thing that's in our heart, I don't see how he's going to do it. He's the Lord, our shepherd. We don't get too old for this. My mom taught me this verse when I was about three years old. And when I married Mac seven years ago, as we were coming down the aisle, she said it to me again. Why would, I mean, mom, I'm like 50 now. And you're quoting that baby verse to me. But I've needed it more in the last seven years being married to that man. I'm just joking. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say, it doesn't, the word doesn't get old. And the truth of the word of God doesn't expire. Now let's talk about Jesus. There are three that bear record in heaven, God the Father and the Word. And we know that according to John chapter 14, 
Well, we know according to John chapter 1, verse 14, is that the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. So we know that we're talking about Jesus when we talk about the truth of the word. Thomas said unto him in, in John 14, verse 5, And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus squared them away by saying this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to me but by the Father. Jesus said, I am truth. John chapter 17, verse 17. It says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Well, okay. Don't raise your hand. Okay. Don't even look at me. <laughs> if you haven't read your Bible this week, just wiggle your toe inside your shoes. If you got on sandals, you only have to do that. Okay? If it's been 24 hours, if it's been a month or so since you picked up the word or listened to it, or then you're missing out on truth and you're buying into a lie. Wait a minute, Liz. How can you be so bold as to say that I'm buying into a lie? Because it's all around us. It's the lies of the world are all around us and they're attempting to get in. They want to get in. And so if we're not combating it with the truth of the word of God, then we're buying into a lie. It's subliminally going on. And so some of you, maybe you're, you're freshly born again, like maybe one of these guys on the top row up here. You just gave your heart to Jesus maybe last week or something. And you say, wait a minute, I want this truth. But there's so much in my head, so much in my heart, so much going on around me that is overwhelming. Then this is what I say to that. I say you have to get an overdose then. Sometimes you just have to get an overdose. You know, on the word of God. That means like you just pop it on and you just let it play through your house. You may not be actively listening because you have to do other stuff going on, but it's still going on in the house. Right. Some of you sleep with your TV on all night. I can't sleep without some noise. I got to have some noise. Well, then put on the word of God because that other stuff that's getting in your head while you're sleeping because it's going in there. Then. Let it go with the word of God, because if you got a cup, let's just say I had a clear glass up here. Everybody drink all their water today? If I had this, this bottle of water, let's just say, yeah, this bottle of water. And in this bottle, somebody put something that I really don't like. Uh, let's say that they put a drop of kale juice in here. Kale. Okay, don't even raise your hand if you like kale. Okay. <laughs> Somebody put some, uh, you know, some kale juice in here, all right? And so I don't like kale juice. And this is the only bottle that I can drink from. So if I wanted to clear it, but I was unable to turn it upside down to pour it out, if the only way I could get rid of the kale was by putting something else in, if I pour enough water... If I just continue, y'all just imagine I just turned on the kitchen faucet and I'm just letting the water run in here. Eventually, what's going to happen to the kale juice? It's going to what? That's right. It's going to come out from the pure water that's going in. It's going to force it out. And guys, so I don't care what's going on in your mind. If you got a bunch of kale juice going on in your head. If you got a bunch of kale juice going on in your heart, and somebody who likes kale juice, they're like, mmm, yay, ooh, I love it. <laughs> so anyway, uh, if you got that going on in you, but you want it out, if you continue to pour the fresh, clean water of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and praise and honor, it will flush it out. Because right now, some of us may be in a situation where... Like, you know, I'm just so tired. You know, I did something the other day and I was like, oh, I did it again. And I almost went into, Liz, you know better. You did this and it's been so long. You shouldn't be doing that anymore. You shouldn't be thinking that anymore. Blah, 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 blah. And about five sentences in to that 
ugly talk, the Holy Spirit rose up in me and said, you know what to do, flush it out. Just flush it out. And if it comes back again, just keep flushing until it goes down. Y'all know what I mean. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, you know what she's talking about. <laughs> so Jesus is true. John 17, sanctify thyself with thy word. Thy word is true. John chapter 1, verse 14. I read that. I stuck that already. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as only, of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and study the soul thyself approved unto God. I know. I like class participation. So every time y'all see the word truth, y'all go ahead and say it with me, okay? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. Psalm 119, verse 160. Thy word is truth. from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgment endureth forever. Ephesians 4.21. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Amen? Amen? So we see that God the Father is truth. Jesus, the word is truth. And now let's talk about the spirit of truth. Because sometimes God can seem so far away. And Jesus, you know, he's coming on. But we have this spirit of truth abiding in us and we know they're one and sometimes people say how can you believe in the trinity how does that work you know i don't understand it and i can't believe anything i don't understand well you know what i just have to believe that there are some things that the all-knowing almighty creator of the universe he that has always been Always shall be. I have to just come to the conclusion that there's something that he's smarter at than I am. Yeah. And I'm just going to have to say, you know what, God? I trust you. So if you say that there are three that bear witness in heaven, God the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, I'm just going to believe that it's true even though I don't understand how it works. Because one day the Bible says, I will know even as I am known. And until then, there's some things I just have to trust. So the spirit of truth, John chapter 14, 15, 16, um, all our discourse all is, a, is a conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. And it is like his last words. It's, it's like his uh, farewell address as he's talking to his, his disciples, preparing them for what is to come. And so we're going to see that Jesus says the same thing in every chapter, John 14, 15, and 16, to his disciples as he's preparing them for his departure. And he says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may, be, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So Jesus is telling his disciples that this spirit of truth that's coming. And when I was, I was reading this, I thought, you know, folks that have trouble lying. Anybody ever had trouble lying? All right, all y'all come to the altar. Okay. <laughs> I'll talk to the teenagers. Y'all will be truthful with me. Any of y'all ever talk? Well, you know, maybe I, should, maybe I shouldn't say it this way. Any of you ever told a lie more than once? Now I got... Because <laughs> some of y'all sitting next to y'all spouse and say, if I raise my hand, they're going to ask me what lie was it, and I don't even... <laughs> kind of like, you know, that love letter that you've been holding on to from sixth grade, it's like... He was just so sweet. I don't have no feelings for him anymore. I just read it just to make me feel good. <laughs> Max finna go through my stuff and throw out all my old love letters. <laughs> so if anybody has ever had any trouble with not telling the truth, 
then you can combat that with this. You have the spirit of truth as a believer living inside of you. You don't have to lie anymore. Tell your neighbor, say, you don't have to lie anymore. Tell yourself, you don't have to lie anymore. <laughs> See how excited y'all get about certain things and how other things y'all mumble. When I say God lives in you, yes, is this an app or yes? You don't have to lie anymore. You don't have to lie anymore. <laughs> because next time you attempt to lie, the Holy Spirit is going to say, you don't have to lie anymore. And you're going to be like, if I tell the truth, I'm going to get in trouble. But you don't have to lie anymore. All right, so here we go. And that was John 14. Look at verse 26 of that same chapter. But when the comforter is come, no, 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 that's not the same chapter. That's 15. John chapter 15, verse 26. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of? Which proceeded from the Father, and he shall testify of me. John 16, verse 13. How be it, when he, the spirit of? Is come, he will guide you into all. For he shall not speak of himself. For whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. The Holy Spirit is here to guide us into all truth. Let's look at an example of that. And Pastor actually, you know, kind of read through the verse of Scripture um, last week, so I won't. I'll just kind of walk you through it. It's found in Acts chapter 10, and it is when Cornelius is praying and an angel comes to him. Y'all remember? Pastor talked about that. With, um, and so an angel comes to this man named Cornelius, and Cornelius was not a believer. He wasn't even a Jew. But an angel comes to him and tells him that God has heard his prayers, gives him some instructions, tell him to send some men to Joppa to a man uh, named uh, uh, a tanner named Simon. And he has another guy named Simon who is there, Simon Peter, and he won't tell Peter to come to you. So Cornelius follows those instructions. G, uh, Peter is up on the rooftop. He's having a vision and the vision of all, all these unclean animals, you know, and, he, and the Bible says that God says, kill and eat. Peter says, no, I've never had touched an unclean thing. I'm not doing it. God sends it again, kill and eat. Peter says, I ain't doing it. One more time, kill and eat. Peter says, no, I don't eat unclean things. And the vision disappears. And then the knock on the door and the mean, uh, somebody comes up and says, Peter, there's somebody here to see you. The Holy Spirit has told Peter to go with them. So Peter goes and he gets to Cornelius' house, who is not a Jew, so he is unclean. And according to Jewish law and tradition, Peter's not supposed to go into the house. But because the spirit of truth has revealed to Peter that they are not unclean and that your tradition is in error to the truth of God's heart. Yeah. Peter goes in and this family's born again. Amen. So what tradition, what truth, untruth, what lie is keeping you from being a blessing to somebody that you feel like is not in your league or I don't hang around or I don't talk to or I don't share with or I don't go to that kind of church or I don't deal with those kind of people or. But the spirit of truth washed out that error in Peter's mind and Peter opened himself up to a whole new ministry. He opened up the kingdom of God to a whole new world of people. Because have you ever looked at a map of Israel or to the rest of the world? It's so small. And if Jesus, if the Israelites had kept Jesus to themselves, what a minute part of the population, what a small part of the population would have come to know Jesus. But because of the spirit of truth, Peter opened it up and look at us. We are part of that right now today. You're born again because G Peter listened to the spirit of truth. 
Y'all see that? That's pretty stinking cool. And so what area could be opened up if you allowed the spirit of truth to speak to you to correct some error in you? Okay, let's talk about somebody else. Let's talk about the Apostle Paul and the chapter previous to that. In the book of Acts chapter 9, many of you may know the story, but his name was Saul at the time. And Saul was about his business. Consider the father's business. He was doing the work of God, getting rid of all these crazy Christians. He was, I mean, it was his mandate from the Lord, he believed. I've been called to do this. I've been called to rid our country, our people, our pure religion from this heresy, from this radicalness, and this Jesus thing. I'm getting rid of them. And he had the right, or the, according to the law, papers to put them in prison, to have them killed, to have them stoned, and he did. And on his way to claim another city for Jesus, I mean for God, getting rid of these Jesus people, on his way to Damascus, he's knocked down by a bright light. And he says, who art thou, Lord? And Jesus' response to him was, I am Jesus whom you persecute. Now, Jesus, Paul had never seen or operated or had any relations with Jesus in the flesh. But Jesus said, you're persecuting me. So in persecuting his people, they were persecuting Jesus. So guys, when people put you down for being a believer, when you get in trouble, you know, for reading your Bible, when people make fun of you for, you know, loving folks that not like you and inviting everybody to church or going to a church like this and stuff like that, when people make fun of you or put you down or whatever, don't even worry about it. Because Jesus got your back. Because when they were persecuting, when... Saul was persecuting the Christians. Jesus took it personally. So when folks mess with you, Jesus takes it personally. He does. And so he said, why are you persecuting me? And Paul was born again. Paul got up and he became, he became one of those radical believers. You know why? Because the spirit of truth ridded him of the lies that he had believed for years. And guys, there are people in your family. And you've been, you've been born again for six months. And because everybody in your family is not born again yet, you're like, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, they ain't going to make it. Why do I do that? Why did I go to that country once? I don't know. But <laughs> we get all distressed and all been out of shape. But look at Saul. Saul persecuted them. He killed them. He had thrown them thrown in jail. He was a horrible man as far as the Christians were concerned. And God delivered him and used him to turn the world upside down. So don't you give up on your family member. Don't you give up on that hard-headed person, that son of yours, that daughter of yours, that husband of yours, that wife of yours, that daddy, that mama of yours. Don't you give up on cousin them. Don't you give up. I don't know who was connected to Paul, but he may have had a praying grandma. His mama may have been at one of Jesus' revivals. Paul may have had a sister that got healed in the crowd when Jesus healed them all. I don't know who may have been praying for Paul, but I do know that the prayers of the righteous avail much. So you don't stop praying. You don't stop believing. Because if God can do it for a Saul, he can do it for a Sam, he can do it for a Sally, he can do it. Come on now. Can he do it? Yes, he can. I said, can he do it? Yes. yes. Give the Lord some praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, while we have all this faith stirred up in the building, I want you to think about somebody that you want born again. Somebody you may have, you know, felt led to talk to or you've talked to him already or you've been talking to him for years. Whatever it is, somebody that's on your heart and you want to see them living for Jesus. Just imagine a picture of them in your mind. See them in your mind's eye. 
So, Father, we thank you for the hundreds of people right now that are being lifted up. We thank you for the sons and the daughters, the husbands, the wives, the aunts, the uncles, the grandchildren that we are envisioning right now. We thank you that it's not your will that any should perish, but that all should come into repentance. You said that, you were, that we should pray for laborers in the vineyard. So we pray right now for laborers, somebody that they'll listen to, somebody that they'll hear, somebody that they'll see on TV, something that they'll remember from when they were in Sunday school as a little boy or a little girl. But we thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit chasing them down like a hound dog. Thank you, Father. And we praise you that we will see the goodness of the Lord concerning them in the land of the living. Now let's praise the Lord like it's already done. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for turning their hearts. Thank you for helping them see the light. Thank you for giving them, Lord God, an insight and understanding. Holy Spirit, thank you for joining them in. Come on, praise him one more time. Woo-hoo-hoo! Woo-hoo-hoo! Hallelujah. Amen. So we see through Paul's conversion, and we see through Peter's enlightenment, that the spirit of truth is at work. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's at work right now. Pastor talked about how he's in us. And how he's showing us things. And how he wants to use us to be a blessing to others. And guys, he wants to show you more truth. There's more to it. You don't know it all. Tell your neighbor you don't know it all. Tell another neighbor, say, you don't know it all either. See how low y'all were on that one? Do you see? You see how low y'all got? You don't know it. I don't know it all. Guys, we don't. But the truth is that the spirit of truth abiding in us right now wants to reveal more to us. Every time we open up the book, he wants to show us more. He wants to give us more insight. He wants to give us more revelation. He wants to give us more understanding. He wants to, he wants to make Jesus bigger in our heart and in our mind than he's ever been before. He wants to do that. And when we seek him, when we ask, The Bible says, ask and it'll be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone that asketh, receiveth, that he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, the door shall be opened. He's not trying to hold anything back. And, And we walk around, you know, saying things like, show me God, show me God, show me God. And we really should be saying, help me see. Help me see it. Help me see it. What are you saying? Help me see that. Give me the insight. Help me understand. Amen? Okay. So what is the spirit of truth saying about our relationship with God? John 3, 16 and 17. One of my favorite verses of scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Check out 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So if you're walking around as a believer condemned, that's not the will of God concerning you. He loves you. God loves you. As a believer, you don't have to walk in condemnation. You don't have to walk in fear. You don't have to walk in dread. You don't have to walk in regret. You are loved of God. And the spirit of truth wants you to know that. You're loved of God. He wants to remind you daily that you're the apple of his eye. You are his beloved. I was playing a song for Mac the other day. I was like, they sing this to me. And, um, And the song was by, I think, Brian McKnight. It says, you know, I'll hold nobody else's hand but yours. I'll kiss nobody else's lips but yours. It's like, you know, I mean, you know, you're the only woman for me. Amen? Ladies, we like stuff like that, don't we? Say amen, somebody. If y'all don't, I do. We want to know how special we are, right? And when we're listening to the spirit of truth, he's telling us you're special to God. You're his favorite. He loves you so much. He has a plan and a purpose for you, a good plan. 
He wants to, you know, woo you with God's loving kindness. The Bible says we're drawn by his loving kindness. He draws us to himself. So concerning our relationship with him, we're loved of God. John 4, 1 John 4, 6 and 7. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth us not. Hereby we know, we, hereby we know the spirit of and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. For God is love. That's the God who loves you. Not that he has love, not that, you know, he gives love, but he is love. You cannot separate love from God. What does God say? What does the spirit of truth say about our, our body? It says that we're healed. First Peter 2.24. It says Jesus bore our sicknesses, carried away our diseases, and by his stripes we were healed. It says in Matthew chapter 15, verse 26, it says, he, but he answered this woman, he said unto her, it's not me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. But if you know the first part of that scripture, uh, this woman came to him and she wanted to be healed. She wanted her daughter to be healed. And Jesus said that healing is like the children's bread. Anybody had breakfast today? Anybody get one of those sausage biscuits out there? All right. So that was bread, Right? I mean, if you don't have anything, you, you got bread. Am I right? You got bread. I mean, if, if you're going to have a meal, there's probably going to be bread if you don't have anything else. When I was growing up, if we didn't have anything else, we had some bread. Right? And God is saying that my healing for you is like bread. It's, it's not a delicacy. It's not like having filet mignon or, you know, having, you know, Alaskan salmon. It's like bread. It's what I freely provide easily. It's just a part of the meal. And God has provided for us. And the spirit of truth wants to reveal that, that that's available to us. Amen. The spirit of truth wants us to know that in our emotions, that he's a spirit of peace. My peace I give to you. My peace I leave with you. When it comes down to our finances, he said that I want you prosperous in good health, even as your soul does prosper. And then John chapter 8, verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It's the truth that you know that liberates you. Just like a lie will bind you, the truth will set you free. And if you're searching... Facebook or YouTube or your friends or all that for the truth. Guys, I want to encourage you. Go to where the truth is. The spirit of truth lives in you. The word and the spirit and the father, they agree. You can know the truth. It's available to you. Amen. Let's stand. You may be sitting you say thank you, Father, because I said stand up. There you may be standing. <laughs> you may be in this room today, and the Holy Spirit has touched your heart and saying, you know what? I want to be able to hear the Spirit of Truth speak to me. I want to know. I want a relationship with this Jesus that they're talking about. The one that's the way, the truth, and the life. I want this. Well, it is available to you. So if you're in this room right now and your heart has been touching, you're thinking, I want to know Jesus. I want the spirit of truth living in me. I want the Holy Spirit in my life. I want that comforter. I want to understand this peace and this joy that's available. If you're a believer already, this is a wonderful time for you to pray under your breath in the spirit to intercede for somebody in this room that needs to know Jesus. And so, Father, we just thank you right now. We thank you for every man and woman and child in this room, and especially for those that have not yet received Jesus as their Savior, received this life-giving spirit, have, haven't received the precious gift of a relationship with you. Father, I ask right now 
that you would help them to say yes to you. Help them say yes. So if you're in the room and you want to know Jesus as your Savior, sincerely, you want life, you just know, you're tired of doing it on your own and you see the reality of who Jesus is for you. Pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. I repent of living life on my own, and I turn to you. I receive you now. Fill me with your spirit. Spirit of truth, I receive you. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord praise in the house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.